Good afternoon and welcome to the fourth part of my six part series on sustainable agriculture. Today I'm going to be talking about food sovereignty and this is distinguishable by from food security in many ways. Food security as defined by the Food and Agricultural Organization, the FAO, exists Food security exists when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. So food security emphasizes access to adequate nutrition for all, which could be provided by food from one's own country or from global imports. In the name of efficiency and enhanced productivity, it generally has reinforced what can be called the corporate food regime, with its uh, emphasis or on large-scale industrialized corporate farming based on specialized production and trade liberalization. Food security has then an inattention to the political economy of the corporate food regime. And it is really blind to the adverse effects of that regime with the large scale industrialized corporate farming and, and that it really emphasizes and supports this types of production. So then food security has this inattention to the political economy of a corporate food regime. And it is, and to also to the adverse effects of that regime particularly in terms of its, their effect on small producers and in terms of the global ecological degradation associated with that regime. So food sovereignty was born in response to many people's disillusion with food security and to the disillusion with the dominant global di discourse about food provisioning and policy. So at the Forum for Food Sovereignty in Senengue, Mali in 2007, 500 delegates from about 80 countries adopted what's called the Declaration of Mialani. And it says this, food sovereignty is the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods and their right to define their own food and agricultural systems. It puts those who produce, distribute, and consume food at the heart of food systems and policies rather than the demands of markets and corporations. It defends the interests and inclusion of the next generation. It offers a strategy to resist and dismantle the current corporate trade and food regime and directions for food farming, pastoral and fishery systems determined by local producers. Food sovereignty prioritizes local and national economies and markets and empowers peasant and family driven, family farmer driven agriculture, artisanal fishing, pastoralist led grazing and food production, distribution and consumption based on environmental, social, and economic sustainability. Food sovereignty uses a social ecological model and it is tied to ecologically sound or environmentally and socially responsible farming. It is also directly linked with democracy and social justice because the focus is on inclusivity and diversity based on gender, class, race and other such factors. Also, there is incredible importance put on indigenous and also female voices in this participatory type of governance structure. So really the face of the food sovereignty movement is the Via Campesina. And the Via Campesina is a peasant organization of some 148 different organizations from 73 countries. And it, was, it came about in 1993. 
It is an autonomous organization. It has no political, religious, or economic affiliations. It has a pluralist leadership, and it is also multicultural. It essentially went from a narrow producer-based movement to this broader, inclusive, and diverse membership with members in North and South from different classes and different races, and also from urban and rural areas. So food sovereignty today. Well, we have moved from the organization Via Campesina and the movement itself has really moved from a broad based movement to, sorry, a production based movement rather, to more of a, a wide range of issues, including and, it, and to encompass a wider range of stakeholders as well. And this includes urban farming, but also so fisheries, consumers, and other, other entities. Um, food sovereignty has also gained traction in political discourse. So to some degree, at the UN, there is some recognition and there are rural development policies in the EU that have been enacted, and as well as in national governments or national legislation like the Mali, in, in Mali, Bolivia, Nepal. In 2008, for instance, Ecuador became the first country to enshrine food sovereignty in, in its constitution. Since that time, other countries have also enshrined food sovereignty as part of their constitution or laws. And these include countries like Venezuela, Mali, Bolivia, Nepal, and Senegal, and also Egypt. In practice, um, for the first time in Canada, food sovereignty has become part of a national movement. And the Canadian government set up a national food policy council which is basically responsible for a comprehensive policy for both food security and food sovereignty. And in our country, they are dealing with issues like food sovereignty, rural and remote community food sovereignty, um, local and urban food systems, sustainable agriculture, and probably the most pertinent in our case is indigenous food sovereignty as well. In Nepal, Nepal, the All Nepal Peasant Federation has lobbied for food sovereignty to become part of their interim constitution. And Nepal's new constitution has enshrined the right of food as a fundamental right for its citizens. In, so what are the sort of elements of food sovereignty? Well, there is really a broad range of, well, it, it, food sovereignty essentially, it includes like a broad range of support for agricultural productive systems. It's, it really is democratic in its decision-making. It also includes some, to some extent, at least some type of localization of the food system. It also tries to support some self-sufficiency. And also it pays a lot of attention to indigenous and local knowledge production as part of, as part of the measures to address food, food security. And one big case that I want to draw your attention to, which you're probably all familiar with, is efforts by farmers in India to assert control over the way that they sell food. So in 2021, in May of this year, there were many, there were many steps that the ruling national government took, but one of them was to target the Agricultural Produce Market Committee, so APMCs. And APMC is essentially a marketing board that was established by the state uh, and in, it, is, it is used to ensure that farmers are safeguarded from exploitation by large retailers, as well to, to ensure that the farm to retail price spread doesn't not reach excessively high levels. So the APMC essentially 
is able to support the food sovereignty of farmers and, and food sovereignty in India. But the government has basically targeted the APMC and said they want to dismantle it. And this government, the government has basically said they want to end this monopoly and allow anyone to purchase and sell agricultural produce. And they believe that this will eventually give farmers more ability to sell, to, to manage their own resource and, and to improve their farm income. However, the farmers really are very much in disagreement about the government's decision. And a, for example, the Via Campesina of, in South Asia made a statement that goes, that, that reads, this move will allow private companies to dictate the supply and demand, threatening food security and guaranteed prices for farmers. The entry of big corporate groups will create more trouble as they will use their financial might to drive down prices, accentuating the crisis that the farmers already face. A, someone uh, speaking to the Telegraph, uh, Rakesh Tiket of the Rakhita Kisan Union said, feared that the government was looking to dismantle the minimum support mechanism itself and that this seemed like the first step in that direction. And he's quoted as saying, most of the farmers are small and marginal ones who cannot move their produce to far off places, even when they know they can get a better price there. Farmers cannot do, a hat, do that, what traders and scouts for prices and transport that produce. So what we are seeing now is essentially in this case, farmers trying to assert their rights over their, over their ability to get a, a reasonable price for their food. And the, the government's actions, of course, are seem, appear to them to be in, in, con, in conflict with that. So in the next lecture, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about food sovereignty, but in relation to another movement, which is called agroecology which is more based on looking at how we can change on farm, on farm practices to enhance the food, food security over the long run and, and also to in, ensure food sovereignty. Thank you.